archaeologist who specializes in the origins of art. And when I was in my 20s and still a graduate student, I had the most incredible opportunity to travel to Israel to study what is probably the oldest figurine in the world. It's called the Barakat Ram figurine. It's really tiny. It's you know, about 35 millimeters or so. And it was made by pre-modern humans 233,000 years ago. And this was an incredible project to be part of because there was a lot of controversy over whether or not this was actually a figurine or just a strangely shaped rock. <laughs> <laughs> and resolving this controversy or this debate would have really important implications for understanding the origins of art and for understanding the pre-modern minds that had made it. And the reason for the controversy, though, is that the figurine is made from a volcanic material called scoria. And when scoria is thrown out of a volcano in a liquid state and it's tumbling and turning and as it cools and hardens in the air, it can take on really strange shapes. So it was very probable that this was just another strangely shaped piece of scoria. At the same time, other archaeologists argued that 200,000 years ago, a pre-modern human picked up this piece of scoria, saw in it something that looked vaguely like a woman, and carved it to make it look more like a woman by putting an, a neck groove here and an arm groove here. So I traveled to Israel with my friend and colleague, Dr. Francesco Derrico from the University of Bordeaux to see for ourselves. And when we arrived there, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what are the differences between natural grooves and stone tool made grooves on scoria and other kinds of volcanic material. And when we felt confident that we could distinguish one from the other, it was time to look at the Barakat Ram figurines grooves under a scanning electron microscope, which is a very powerful microscope. And I have to tell you, it took easily a year of negotiations to be able to take the figurine on a small field trip from the museum where it's housed to the facility where this microscope was located. And I have never been more terrified in my life. I mean, here I am, a graduate student. I've got probably one of the world's most you know, important cultural artifacts in the equivalent of a shoebox next to me in the back of a taxi, <laughs> and we're <laughs> zooming off. And I think the trip only took like 20 minutes, but it seemed like hours. Anyways, so we finally got there, we did our work, and I will say that much to my shock and surprise, we found that both the neck groove and the arm groove uh, were carved with stone tools. So we were so excited. Francesco and I wrote up our results, and we published them in the Cambridge Archaeological Journal, and all of our peers loved it. They said, you know, this is the kind of study that really needed to be done, and you have really put to rest whether this is a figurine or not. Except that we hadn't. <laughs> One uh, colleague said, you know, I always thought this was a figurine, and now I'm sure. I mean, look at her. You can see how she styles her hair. <laughs> I had another colleague who said, you know, I never thought this was a figurine, and now I'm sure. I mean, look at it. It's doodling or whittling. A third colleague said, well, I don't know if it's a woman. It looks more like a penguin to me. And a fourth colleague said, penguin? That's a penis. And at the same time, Discover Magazine reported on our work, but they asked whether it was art or a lump. <laughs> and Forbes Magazine actually printed it on its side because they couldn't figure out how to orient it. <laughs> 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 and at the same time, there were all of these websites uh, popping up calling it a Stone Age goddess. And L'Oreal, the, the cosmetic company, contacted me because they were publishing a series of books called 100,000 Years of Beauty, and they wanted me to write an essay on what I thought the figurine told us about the origins of beauty. So clearly, very different opinions on how to interpret this artifact. So the question is then, what is it and how do we know? Well, Francesco and I had said, look, our job had been to figure out whether this was stone tool produced or just a rock, and we had done that. But whether it was a figurine or not, we just didn't know. I mean, from one angle, it kind of looks like a woman, 
But the problem is, is that we humans are so good at seeing faces in natural objects. It's something that scientists call pareidolia. And that's why you have lots of stories about the man in the moon and why every now and again someone sees Jesus in a piece of toast. <laughs> and as one of my other colleagues, Ian Tattersall from the Natural History Museum in New York said, we modern humans find it so hard to imagine a state of consciousness other than our own. And by this he meant that we assume that what we see and think and feel when we look at a piece of scoria is what pre-modern humans 200,000 years ago also saw and thought and felt when they looked at this piece of scoria. Okay, so let's move forward to 2009 and the discovery of another figurine, this time in Germany. This is the Holofels figurine. It's a little bit bigger, it's about 60 millimeters or so. It dates to 35,000 years ago. It's made of mammoth ivory. It's engraved uh, and with things that might represent body tattooing. It doesn't have a head, but it has a hook, so it was probably worn as a pendant. And as you may have noticed, she has um, other assets, <laughs> shall we say. Um, so you might not be surprised to know that this is how the, the media reported this figurine's discovery. So the Sun called it the world's first page three girl. <laughs> Science asked if this was the earliest pornography. <laughs> My absolute favorite is The Economist that called it Paleolithic Pornography Unveiled, smut carved from a mammoth tusk. <laughs> <laughs> so you might not be shocked to know, to see these sort of attention-grabbing headlines, right? But you might be more surprised to know that for the most part, these journalists were simply echoing things they had heard scientists say. So for example, this figurine was published originally in the journal Nature. Nature is the most prestigious journal in the world for scientific discovery. And this is how Nature described it. A prehistoric pinup. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> and a 35,000-year-old sex object. And the summary article that went along with it implied that it was bordering on pornographic, it was sexually explicit, and even aggressively sexual. So, and these words are not only picked up by the media and make their way into pop culture, but they can also be picked up by scientists in other fields. So here, for example, is an essay in Discover magazine by two evolutionary psychologists who specialize in the study of internet porn. Um, because you can, so why wouldn't you? <laughs> so, and they argued, they argued that men's obsession with pornography dates back to prehistory, that men's brains are actually designed to objectify women, and what's most interesting for us is that they're basing this in part on their interpretation of the archaeological record, so their interpretation of the Ice Age figurines I've been showing you. So they refer to one of them as having a double G-cup-sized uh, breast and a hippopotamal butt, and they refer to the Holdefelds figurine as having, and I quote, a titanic labia. <laughs> yeah, those are two words I hoped never to hear in the same sentence. <laughs> so. <laughs> so as we saw with the Barakat Ram figurine, Interpreting what these figurines mean is anything but straightforward. And I think if you're going to use words like sex object and pornography, then you're making three main assumptions. And the first assumption is that these figurines are made by men for men. Unfortunately, we don't actually know who made these figurines, but through forensic studies of handprints, footprints, and things called finger flutings, which is when Ice Age uh, peoples drew in soft sediment using their fingers. With forensic studies of these kinds of things, we know that men, women, and even children participated in all aspects of cave art. The second half of this, though, is that it's made for men. And this is the idea that only a man would be aroused by the sight of a naked woman. And this goes back to the idea that evolutionarily, men look for young, fertile women to mate with, while, uh, whereas women look for good providers. And in a modern context, modern context you can think of uh, Kanye West's song, Gold Digger, because that's the whole story right there. <laughs> 
And so, and this has allowed people, psychologists like Steven Pinker and others, to argue that it would make evolution, no evolutionary sense for a woman to be aroused by the sight of a nude male. I guess the idea is that he would drop his loincloth, she would be overcome with desire, forget that she was looking for a good provider, and mate with potentially uh, the wrong guy. And so, <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> and so, the Kinsey studies of the 1940s and 50s seem to really support this, right? Women at that time reported not being aroused by nude photos or nude drawings of men. But if you flash forward in time to the present day, what we see is that one in every three visitors to adult sites are women. And studies done in the 1980s and more recently show that, in fact, women are aroused by visual stimuli. So what happened? Was there a mutation? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's much more uh, historical changes, right? The rise of feminism, the availability of the birth control pill, and changes uh, in our attitude towards sex more broadly. Okay. So the second assumption that you have to make is that these figurines represent what Ice Age guys would have found sexy. So in other words, curvy women. And this is based on the idea that uh, the ratio of a woman's uh, waist to her hips is a good indicator of overall health and fertility. And the evolutionary ideal ratio is a 0.7. Now, if that doesn't mean anything to anybody here, I'm going to ask Jessica Alba to show us what that looks like. <laughs> she is sporting an evolutionary ideal waist-to-hip ratio. <laughs> but as you know by now, this is what Ice Age figurines look like. Not only do they not look like Jessica Alba, uh, but in fact, <laughs> there's all sorts of variation here. And there's not only just women, but we also see male figurines, we see animal figurines, and as you can see on the end, uh, fantastical creatures as well. And a recent study looking at the actual waist-to-hip ratio in figurines found that instead of corresponding to this sexy ideal, uh, they in fact represented women of all stages of life. Because your waist-to-hip ratio changes as you grow older, you have kids, and so on. Okay, so the third assumption that you have to make is that we today know what Ice Age peoples would have found pornographic. And what I want to do is show you three very brief examples of how that's even hard to decide in our own society. This first example here, here we have a 19-year-old male model on the cover of Dossier magazine. Some U.S. retailers uh, requested that this issue be placed in opaque uh, plastic bags like porn, I mean, sorry, like Hustler or any other porn magazine, because they argued that consumers might mistake the male model for a female model that was topless and therefore would be pornographic. So pornography in this case depended on what the viewer thought he or she was looking at. A second example is uh, when the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, better known to you and I as uh, Will and Kate, arrived on the Solomon Islands and they were being presented with flowers by uh, bare-breasted women. They were also, that same week, in court fighting to suppress topless photographs of Kate that had been taken by French journalists when she was sunbathing. The journalists argued, well, bare breasts aren't taboo anymore, so we should be allowed to publish these. They lost. <laughs> However, what this shows us is that whether bare breasts are taboo or not depends on who you are and where you are. And finally, recently Playboy magazine said they were no longer going to publish uh, nude photographs. They said with the internet, you are one click away from anyone doing anything. And that porn magazines had now lost their shock value, their commercial value, and their cultural relevance. Okay, so these three examples show us how difficult it is in our own society to agree on what's pornographic or even erotic. And so it should make us very wary of trying to project that back onto the past if people in the Ice Age even had a concept of pornography. But at the end of the day, in the end of my talk, does it matter if we call a hunk of mammoth ivory pornographic? I think it does, because words have impact. 
How we look at prehistory and what we ascribe to prehistory is often more a reflection of who we are today than who our ancestors were then. If we take a figurine and we hold it up to a mirror and all we see is pornography, what does that say about us and how we see women? But if instead we see coming from the, this figurine all kinds of questions, the way we did with the Barakat Ram figurine, and we want to peer more deeply, then we may get a chance to understand things about our ancestors rather than continually looking at a reflection of ourselves that feeds the media but tells us very little about who we are today and even less about who we might have been then. Thank you. <laughs>